Thank you very much. <clears throat> My name is uh, Jonathan Mukai Height, and I'm a software mentor at Groundworks. Groundwork. We're a new mentorship based uh, consultancy based out of New York City. So, let's talk about controller tests. Almost no one knows how to test controllers. And uh, I want to impress on you that I'm speaking from a position of having worked on dozens and dozens and dozens of projects over the last four years. I was a consultant at Pivotal Labs. I've been working in the New York City startup scene as a freelancer. And now, part of this new consultancy. So I've worked on dozens of projects. And I've seen many, many sort of controller anti-patterns. So before we get into controller anti-patterns, let's, let's take a minute, let's slow down, and let's talk about why we actually write tests. Ruby and Rails are sort of a great ecosystem for TDD and testing, but a lot of people sort of focus on this particular aspect of testing, catching regressions. And catching regressions is a big part of why we write tests. You know, you want to be able to change a part of the application and still be confident that the rest of the application isn't going to break as a result of those changes. But actually, writing modular code and writing your code in isolation is a huge, I would say, like a major part of why the benefit of testing, basically. So I want you to keep in mind, keep that in mind as we look at sort of the controller anti-patterns. So the first one up. Everything is stubbed, right? Uh, this is a pattern that I've seen on a lot of, in, in a lot of controllers. Um, you know, we're stubbing uh, sort of class methods, stubbing find, and we're sort of using that to drive out our implementation. But it's not doing, it's not going to do a tremendous amount to catch regressions, and it's definitely not helping us write our code in isolation because our tests are so coupled to the implementation that when we change the implementation, the test has to change. It's not a particularly useful test, right? Another controller anti-pattern that I've seen is just everything is tested at the integration level. Um, so this sort of makes sense because controllers are these sort of blue-like objects. They take things out of the database, they take resources, and they sort of hand them over to the view. But again, thinking about the major benefits of testing, this misses out, I mean, while this will catch regressions, uh, this is, misses out on a big part of why we write tests, which is being able to write nice, composable, modular code. Here's another controller anti-pattern I've seen, rendering views and then asserting things against the view. This is again a problem of conflating sort of different concerns. So view tests should cover things, you know, that are related to the view, not the controller. And finally, my favorite, uh, my favorite controller anti-pattern, not testing the controller at all. And uh, like I said, I've been, you'd be surprised uh, how many people how many developers out there are not testing their controllers because it actually speaks to sort of a strength of Rails controllers that they're so simple when they're done properly and they're so declarative that it almost feels, it feels silly to write a test that's sort of just asserting that, you know, you fetch the right model from the, from the database and you're sort of presenting it to the view. But I think a lot of things that do matter to controllers are frequently overlooked. So controllers often have this one, one big action, right? Like the show action on a controller is going to go and fetch a resource, render it in the view. But there's all these sort of small details that matter as well, like does this action require authentication? What level of authorization does the user need? What formats does this controller respond to? And these, I would say, are equally as important as sort of the big action that the controller performs. And Rails controllers, when written well, the sort of big action, like you know, loading the resource is so, I mean, if you look at a show action between different applications, like almost every controller show action looks the same except for the resource it's loading, right? Right, so these small concerns, we don't want to overlook them even though they're, you know, they're not as sort of exciting as the big action of the controller. 
So I was also confused about testing controllers. I've been on projects where we were just doing an integration level, we're not testing controllers, or we're doing this stub thing. Controller tests have always felt a little strange to me. And then one day, I, was, I started working on this project with a much more senior developer who had spent a lot of time sort of thinking about controllers, controller testing. He's a huge advocate in the early days of TDD and stuff like that. And he had spent a lot of time thinking about these issues, and he had sort of shown, he had come up with a, a somewhat novel way of testing controllers that I think was really successful, and I want to share that with you today. So, a big part of, you know, the thing that makes Rails controllers so awesome is that they are so declarative. And declarative is a word I'm going to toss around a lot today, so I'd like to just actually start and try to define declarative. Oftentimes when we're talking about declarative code, we're talking about declarative code as opposed to imperative code. So there's sort of two ends of a spectrum. With imperative code, we're sort of defining each step and we're really getting into the logic of each, um, each piece of code. Whereas on the other side of the, on the declarative side, there's sort of no logic. You kind of just say what you want out of an object or out of a particular function and then you get, um, you get that behavior back. It's a little bit easier to explain with examples. So really, it's kind of about keeping uh, logic out of our controller code. So an imperative example, so just going through, uh, maybe this isn't exactly pseudocode, but an imperative style of describing behavior would say, when deleting a user, if the current user is an admin user, then allow the deletion. If the current user is not an admin, then do not allow the de deletion to finish, right? The declarative way of saying this would be to say, only admin users can delete another user. And this runs off of the screen. When a request for a resource comes in, if the request is for JSON, then fetch the resource and render it from the JSON template. If the request is for HTML, fetch the resource and render the HTML. If the request is for another format like PDF, throw an error or render uh, an error. The declarative way of saying this would be, this controller returns a resource represented as JSON or HTML. So I hope, you can, I hope you're getting a sense of what we mean when we're saying declarative, right? So Ruby is great and Rails is great because though Ruby is imperative, it sort of lets us build this framework that lets us write these declarative style uh, controllers. So let's take a look at, let's sort of take, uh, take those examples. Before filter lets us do things like authenticate the user, and in this case we're saying just users need to be authenticated except for the show action. So users can view this thing, but uh, everything else they need to be authenticated for. And we don't have to go through each action and say, you know, if the user is logged in, then do this thing, else do this thing, right? So it's great. Same thing with loading models. This is a, an idiom you'll see in a lot of Rails controllers. You know, there's a method that just fetches the resource. You know, this sort of, this style of code has led to people sort of copying the sort of declarative nature and uh, applying it towards authorization, right? Like we just say, authorize actions if we're using the authority gem. Or you might say, load an authorized resource if you're using the can can gem. So it's sort of clearly become a part of Rails controller culture is to sort of have these declarative style um, behaviors, right? And this is even more so with Rails 4 and responders, right? So we can quickly declare which formats a particular controller responds to. And then in actions like show, we just say, you know, here's the new action, respond with this resource. And because we've declared, oops, because we've declared HTML as JSON as the resources, any other request for like an XML representation of a resource gives you a bad format error, right? So it sort of takes care of a lot of that logic. And it's similar with create. You know, the responder knows what to do with the resource after it's been created. So it's good to keep logic out of the controllers. It's good to sort of be able to say, you know, people have always been talking about skinny controller, fat model, 
it's good to keep logic out of our controllers. But this is not what about 90% of uh, controllers that I come across look like. So frequently, you know, controllers have some amount of business logic mixed in, or there's additional actions besides the CRUD actions. Right, like I said. So again, let's uh, take a minute and think about what we really care about in controllers. Like, we, we know we don't want business logic, right? This is a, not a discussion that we need to rehash over and over again. People have been saying this for, for quite some time. So we care about authentication. That's whether or not the user is who they say they are, whether or not they've logged in in most web applications. And we care about whether or not the user is authorized to perform the particular action that they're going to perform. That is, are, can our logged in users, you know, do, are they authorized to do what they're trying to do here? And we care about presence of resource or what resource we're working with. You know, these are, try to think of the differences between like a show action on one controller and another. They're just fetching a different resource and maybe they have a different sets of permissions. And we care about the response, the format of the response. Is it JSON, is it HTML, is it PDF, this kind of thing. So again, going back to this original point that I started out harping on, we really we write tests because we tests should help us write better code, right? We don't just write tests to to make sure there aren't bugs or anything, right? We you know, a test is more than like a cheap Q&A or a QA process, right? We also want them to help us. That's why it's called test-driven development. We want tests to help us drive good code. So the answer to testing something that's as declarative as a controller is to have declarative tests. How are we going to do this? So the technique that we sort of came up with on our last project was using a number of shared examples in our spec to cover sort of these smaller details of, the, of individual controllers, right? So your sort of your test of like the big action for a particular particular controller can be really simple, right? So maybe a show action is going to assign some resource and just pass it on to the view. A create is going to you know perform this create action. The big actions again they should be so uniform in Rails like you know your scaffolding should basically cover this stuff is one way of thinking about it, right? Oops. So with that in mind, we can sort of focus on sort of the smaller details. Like you might write a, so you might write, obviously this is a little bit unrealistic. Like you're not gonna write a context like with a logged in user and with an unauthenticated user, right? You, you wouldn't do this for every single action because you're just gonna be repeating yourself all over the place. But you can write an, a shared example that's just going to rely on some conventions like setting subject to perform the get, right? And then if we just sort of sign out our user before we run this action, then we expect the redirect to the sign in path, right? And this could be different per project, right? You can tweak this to your project. Then our test becomes simpler, right? Just got our controller here, pull the user from fixtures. You know, before the normal sort of like big actions, we're always gonna sign in the user because we're, we're declaring that this controller needs to require a login and that shared example that we just looked at is gonna sign out the user and make sure that there's a redirect to a sign in page. Or if it's a JSON action, we could also have a test in there to make sure that uh, it's, it's rendering the unauthorized. So authorization is another big concern, right? Or I guess I should say small detail for keeping in that. So again, you can have multiple users, maybe Maybe one way you would test this is you would sort of have a context with an authorized user and you're expecting this create action to succeed. And then with an unauthorized user, you're expecting it to get a 404 or maybe you want a different 
error code is sort of application dependent, right? So we, and on all of our projects, we always have a fixture user called Malicious Mallory that uh, is you know, able to log in but not authorized to do any actions. So you can use this user in fixtures to sort of test what should happen when a user tries to do something that they're not authorized to do. And our shared example might look like this. So you know, before you run the action, sign in Mallory, who we know as a convention of our project is unauthorized to do anything in the application, and we expect to get a 404. So then our shared examples, so they sort of become like a checklist. It starts to kind of grow a little bit, right? We have these uh, require login, require authorization. Next is presence of resource. And here's where we sort of start to get fun with uh, our shared examples. So here I'll present the shared example. Not, not some before and after code, but uh, if we have this shared example that will basically go through and you know, reach into our controller test and change the actual resource that we're fetching, you know, change it to a double, we should get a 404. And we can use this like this. So when we go and get our pizza resource, if that resource doesn't exist, then we get our 404. And finally, we want to test response. We want to specify, we want to declare that, hey, this controller responds to HTML and JSON. So we have this shared example that's going to take an array of acceptable formats for the controller, run the action, and then it's going to take another array of unacceptable formats, basically the difference between the acceptable formats and some of these default ones, and we expect that we'll get a not acceptable status when we run our action. So we can end up with tests like this. It's as simple as saying, this should behave like an action that returns HTML. This action returns HTML and JSON, right? So your test becomes like a checklist, like a spec, like in the original sense of the word spec, like written to spec. You basically have this big checklist, requires authorization, does not require authorization, requires authentication, formats, this kind of thing. You can just declare in your spec the behavior that you want, and then when your tests pass, you're again, you know, you know that your your controller uh, performs these actions the way that you expect. So this is all fine and good for really simple, you know, create, read, update, delete these kind of like CRUD actions that we're used to. But I'm sure some of you are thinking, like these these. Tests, uh, they seem to sort of get a little muddy when we need to introduce things like likes, bookmarks, bulk creates, things that touch multiple records at the same time. Uh, but I would argue that this is sort of not where the, these kinds of concerns, these things that touch multiple models or things that are sort of one-off actions, they don't really belong in controllers. They belong as a separate resource. So this is an, an impromptu uh, survey of projects that I worked on in the last year. Like five of six had some of these sort of actions that don't really belong in the controller. They belong in a separate model, right? So in the past year or two years, I've seen a lot of people are sort of moving towards using active model. An active model is awesome. It lets you create this Ruby object that's not tethered to the database and it allows you to add validations, and basically you can create something that kind of quacks like a Ruby model, but you don't have to be, you know, it doesn't actually need to be database backed, and it can, you know, take a few models as a dependency and then, you know, massage the data or something. It's a great way of, uh, of keeping your controllers really slim, keeping business logic 
in the model where it belongs. So there's not enough time to sort of give a huge overview about using active model, but this is your solution to huge controllers. So there is no resource too small for creating a, like new, a new model with its own controller or something, you know. So again, these models are cheap. It's just a new file. It's not tied to the database even. We have time for an illustrative example. So I guess the last time that I was trying to write and an, uh, recently I was on this project where the client wanted to overhaul. They had this sort of uh, password reset uh, workflow and they wanted to overhaul it and password reset was like an action on the user controller This is one of those things that was like sticking out like a sore thumb, right? So I created uh, So it's really simple, right? There's no validations or anything for it. All it does is take a new um, You know, it takes the email you click submit and it, it sends off the email with the password reset if they exist There's infrastructure there that supported that already and I said to my coworker, the team lead, I was, he was like, you should make a, an active model resource for this. And I was like, I don't know. This is so small. It can just be its own controller. The controller can just load the user model and, and ask it to send the email. You don't need to create an active model resource for it just yet. But sure enough, oh yes, this client was not using Devise yet. So I went back and forth with my coworker about this. This is too simple to break out into a model. Like having its own controller, like moving the action off of the, the sort of like password reset action into its own controller, a password reset request, that was enough. But then requirements change as they frequently do, right? The next stage, the client was like, well, we want to tell people if they're putting in the wrong email. So previously, it was just taking whatever email you would hit submit and it'd be like, okay, I send you a password reset, regardless of whether or not there was actually a user with that email. And then of course requirements changed again. If the user, there's, so we had this feature to lock users out of their accounts after a certain number of uh, bad password tries. So if they're locked out of their account, we don't want to also be sending them a password reset, right? So suddenly there's all these like business concerns inside of the controller. And that's when I realized I should have just done, done the thing early, make its own active model, throw validations on there, and be able to unit test this resource in isolation, and then let the controller be just some vanilla Rails controller. And active model really makes this easy. So again, one thing to sort of think about is you want to think of your application in terms of resources. You, don't, you want to think of nouns, not verbs, right? Like HTTP already has verbs, and we use those verbs to act on nouns, resources that we have. So again, it's a little bit of footwork in the beginning, and this isn't something that you, you know, thinking about controllers this way or writing shared examples, for declarative style controller testing isn't something you want to break out into a gym, right? Every project is going to have slightly different uh, concerns and every project is going to have different conventions. It's something that you need to do at a project level. And it's about building good habits. Like my example from the password reset, you want to have sort of a habit in your project. It's sort of like broken windows theory, right? If someone comes in and they see that there's, you know, we're just adding actions to controllers willy-nilly, when they need to do something and they're not sure where to put it, that's what they're going to do. If they come in and they see that you've sort of nicely composed everything as resources using active model, that's what they're going to do, right? So that's why we have sort of this controller checklist. When Creating a new controller is as simple as going in and you know, adding a couple of shared examples and then running your tests. It becomes very easy to, to sort of build really lightweight, slim controllers. And the rewards are great. Things are easier to test, right? You don't really need to think about, how am I going to test this controller? Because it's already, you know, if you've introduced this sort of idiom, it's already happening in your application. 
everything is a simple create, read, update, destroy, this kind of thing, right? And it drives good design. Having these shared examples, these sort of very strict, prescriptive shared examples keeps, it encourages you to move logic into the model. It keeps the controller simple. I feel like I've been harboring on this the entire time. Anyway, if you can keep your controllers uniform, you can spend more time sort of encapsulating logic inside of models, which are easier to test. OK, thanks so much. Three minutes left. So, real quick, what is your feeling on Rails 4's strong parameters? Because personally, I feel like controllers have way too much to do already. Like you talked about sort of authentication, parameter parsing, communicating with models, uh, rendering, responding you know, all that stuff, right? And now on top of that, we're saying, okay, now the controllers too also need to decide like what kind of data can go in and out. On one hand, it makes sense because like, well, the controller's already deciding if the user is, as you said, authorized. So it could be kind of an extension of like, are you authorized to change this attribute? On the other hand though, it seems like kind of a testing nightmare, right? Because it's like, how do you, how do you test that strong parameters are being used properly if you don't just integration test the whole thing? Yep, yep. Yeah, it's an interesting point. I mean, I'm definitely not opposed. I guess, I guess in, in the Rails world, it's always, uh, it's always best to not fight the framework. So I, I haven't thought too much about whether or not strong params really belong in the controller. I mean, they are sort of, if you think of strong params as sort of like sanitizing data coming in, then it does kind of feel like a controller test. Um, I've run into situations, like recently there was, um, I came across this controller on this legacy code base and we, they were, um, they were doing like, strong params were sort of doing this like if, depending on whether or not, like the current user's role and stuff like that, and that's definitely something that belongs in, in like a validation, right? But in terms of just kind of sanitizing the params, I think it's, I think it's acceptable and uh, I don't know, I, I wouldn't fight the framework, you know? Fair sure enough, thank you. それではお時間ですので、えー、もう一度大きな拍手をお願いいたします。Thank you very much.